feel that we're very scientific here. I feel that ultimately a, a true scientist is a mystic and vice versa. But the, the science we're interested in here is the, the science of reality. So we just investigate the nature of reality. We're not, when the kind of science we conduct here is not the science whose purpose is to um, make driverless cars or send rockets to Mars. Or These are perfectly legitimate scientific endeavors and, and they require scientific methods and investigation. But they're not, um, it's not an inquiry whose purpose is the nature of is, is to discover the nature of reality. So, but, but our methods are, are, are similar. The difference perhaps is that scientists tend, tend to come up with theories and then test it against experience. Here we go directly to our experience and we try to formulate theories as accurately as we as accurately as we can, that describe the reality of that experience. It's what Atmananda Krishnamenon called higher reasoning, reasoning that comes directly from the reality of our experience, rather than reason that starts with concepts and then measures those concepts against what is observed. So most, most of science, the science that's required for driverless cars and rockets to moon, to moon um, these are sciences that, that involve investigation into a part of reality. Here we're interested in the nature of reality itself. And I, I consider it the ultimate science which is a very bold claim. But it's a claim that I think is a reasonable claim for this reason. That everything that anyone, that any scientist, or indeed anyone, but let's stick to scientists, that anything that any scientist knows about anything is known through the faculty of their finite mind. Therefore, the scientist's knowledge of anything can only be as good as his knowledge of his own mind. And in fact, the scientist's knowledge of anything will always appear in accordance with the limitations of his own mind. Therefore, it follows that if we want to know what anything truly is, we have to first know the nature of the mind with which and through which it is known. Therefore the highest investigation that the mind can embark on is an investigation into its own nature. And that's what we do here. Our minds are investigating their own nature or reality. Until that is known, nothing, we cannot be sure that we know anything true about reality because whatever we know of reality will be filtered through and will appear in accordance with the limitations of our own mind. Therefore, the mind's nature of its own essence, and the name that the mind gives to itself is I, so another way we could express this is the investigation into what we call I must be the highest science. That which knows our experience is equally present when our eyes are open as it is when our eyes are closed and we don't only want to have access to the peace of our true nature when our eyes are closed. That would considerably limit the scope of our access to, to peace. So at some stage we need to find the same access to our true nature when our eyes are open. So this is why Ramana Maharshi suggested spending some time during the day with your eyes open, asking yourself, 
to whom does this perception appear? It appears to me. Who am I? What is the nature of the I that knows this perception? That is the Vedantic approach, the inward-facing path. We turn the attention away from the object of experience, the perception in this case, and attention inverts on its source. It traces its way back to its source or essence of awareness. Now the tantric approach is not to invert the attention on its source, but is to allow the attention to continue to go towards objects, in this case towards perception, but to understand that all there is to perception, in, in this case all there is to sight, is the experience of seeing, and all there is to seeing is the knowing of it. In other words, that which knows our experience doesn't just lie in the background of experience, although for many of us if it is accessed there first. It also pervades the whole field of perception, and therefore it's not necessary to turn away from perception in order to access it. So, I would recommend, um, with your eyes closed, first of all, asking yourself the question, uh, what is it that knows or is aware of my experience? And in this way your attention is tracing its way back to its source. But then when your eyes are open, not inverting your attention on its source when your eyes are open, but going in the opposite direction, going towards the experience of perceiving or seeing, because there is no part of the experience of seeing that is not pervaded by the knowing of it. So we don't actually have to turn away from the experience of seeing to access this knowing and its innate peace. In fact, all there is to seeing is the knowing of it, the consciousness of it. So ultimately there's no question of having to turn away from something because there is nothing in experience other than knowing which we have to turn away from in order to find this knowing. Relating to the outward practice that we've been doing around seeing and my experience of the thinking feeling when we have our eyes closed is a sort of dissolving of, of boundaries and then with the instruction around seeing when I open my eyes uh, a couple of different things have happened. One is that the world sort of snaps into place in separate objects in space. It does when I open my eyes too. Yeah. <laughs> and then the practice kind of either stays like that, you know, so I lose any sense of any Okay, close, close your eyes. Okay. Is it clear to you that you are knowing, only knowing? Is there any yes. other substance present in your experience? No. no. The experience of your hand on your mic, on the mic, is there anything there other than knowing, only knowing? No, just knowing the sensation, yeah. But the sensation is made only of knowing. Even to yeah. call it a sensation is to, is to superimpose a concept, an object on it. Go, go deeper than a sense, then labeling it, abandon the label sensation. The newborn infant yeah. knows nothing of sensations. Is there anything there other than knowing? No. And what about the tingling sensation at the soles of your feet? Anything there other than knowing? No. And what about your thoughts? Anything there other than knowing? No. And your feelings? No. Open your eyes. The experience of seeing appears. Is there anything there other than knowing? No. That's it? It's, it's not the illusion of yeah. the world that disappears. It's our 
ignorance of its reality that disappears. I see right. much the same world that you see. If the Ramana Maharshi and the Buddha were sitting here with us this afternoon, they would be seeing much the same world that we see. Only for them the world would have lost its ability to veil its reality from them. So don't expect the world to appear in some magical way. This is the magical appearance yeah. of the world. What is magical is not what we see, but the way we see. And that's the, yeah, that's, it's interesting having a sense of this as knowing and there is a shift and then a qualitative, even in perceiving as knowing, I guess that's distancing it again or making something of it. Well, but you could say that perceiving it is, is, is a, a subtle colouring of knowing. Yeah. Just like the, 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 uh, when the movie begins, the movie is a, you have a, a movie uh, and you, you see an image of the, the s early morning sea and sky and it's all misty. It's a subtle colouring of the screen. But all that's there is the screen. It is the screen that is colouring itself. Right. Well, all there is to this experience is a, a colouring of knowing, or the activity of knowing. However intense the colours are, now mm -hmm. it's kind of a, we're all, most of us I presume are having a fairly neutral experience. It is neither intensely pleasurable nor intensely unpleasant. But if it were, it would still only be made of knowing. Yeah. Okay. And just check that, yeah. wherever you are yeah. in your experience, when you're walking in the forest, when you're having lunch, when, when you're chatting with friends, when you're any moment of experience, your neutral experience, moments of pleasure, moments of discomfort, moments of pain, wherever you are, and, and check it in, in all sorts of different types of experience to make sure that you're really thorough and it's not only true of the pleasant experiences or the neutral experiences, but make sure that it's true of your unpleasant experiences, physical pain for instance. Right. Yeah. To very, just ask yourself very simply, is there any substance present in my current experience other than knowing? Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I, I felt that I would have a that the understanding would have a different impact on me or something, so I think that's... You, you were expecting a, 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 a marvellous experience as a result not, of this understanding. Not necessarily, just a little tiny shift. <laughs> but, or a little it, shift in... The, you know, the little like tiny experience is called peace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just creeps up from you very quietly mm -hmm. in the background of experience. To yeah. begin with, it's just like a a whisper behind the clamor of your experience. You just notice this peaceful presence in the background, but in time that peaceful background begins to invade the foreground and saturate it with its presence. And in times it, it bubbles over in the form of joy or happiness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You might tell me I'm reading the wrong books, but I've been reading Krishnamurti books. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he does make one statement, which is, the observer is the observed. Yes. And when I read that, I can't, you know, I can't wrap my, you know, okay. I just can't, I don't get it. Well, we, we've, I, we, we, I we've, we've, just, we've just demonstrated, I, I know, we, we, that was a perfect demonstration, uh, um, my conversation with Paula okay. was a, was a, could have been a response to the question, what did Krishnamurti mean when he said the observer was the observed, or in relation to our conversation, the knower is the known. Because what we've just done with Paula was collapse the apparent distinction of the knower and the known into a single, irreducible, indivisible unity, pure knowing. 
the knower and the known are abstractions. There is no separate knower of experience and there is no thing that is known. There is just knowing. That's what he meant. Okay. So there's no, there's no, there's no things then. No, there's, there's, there's no, the, 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 there's no thing, there's no object, there's no yeah. world, there's no, and there's no subject to know it. The subject and the object are abstractions. Okay. That is what non-duality, that is what Advaita means, non-duality. There are not two things, not two realities in existence. Mind oh, yeah. that knows and matter that is known. The knower and the known. There is a single infinite indivisible whole and if we are to really we cannot say anything about it even to call it knowing is to say one thing too much about it but we should really we should remain silent about it but given that we want to explore these matters and talk about them we try to use the the word that is closest in our experience and knowing it or aware being but knowing is even even better than aware being. It, it's, it's more close to our experience. Pure knowing. And it's very easy to check that in your experience. Have you... Is anything other than knowing ever known? Have you ever known or could you ever know anything other than knowing? The knowing of experience. No. That's it. And is knowing one experience or two experiences? It's one. It's always one. There is always just one thing, which is not a thing. One taste. At any moment of experience you can check this. Whatever the content of your experience, however wonderful or awful or neutral it may be, you can ask yourself at any moment, is there anything other is there anything to this experience other than knowing? Not even the knowing of it. If it was the knowing of it, there would be knowing and it. We would be back in the subject and the object. It's not the knowing of experience because all there is to experience is knowing. It's just knowing, knowing, knowing. One of my forthcoming books is going to be called Knowing, Knowing Only Knowing. <laughs> That's what Krishnamurti meant. The other question uh, that I have is uh, relating to the position of seeing, the observer. I was sitting, we were sitting in the camp, on the campsite and just look it was early morning and we were it was a couple of days back it was sunny birds were singing and there was a scene you know you could see it was beautiful and i was wondering where is it that this experience is being seen where is it where, where is the experience being observed with sound it felt like it was inside in some in some way well at least I had I had the imagination that it was inside and then it didn't seem to be the same with sight and this was a bit puzzling suddenly I've, I I saw that they were both in the same place but it wasn't what I had previously understood I'd, I'd made somehow made the assumption that what we're supposed to experience is inside, but it wasn't inside. Yes, it was everywhere. Yes, e e exactly. We only say it is experienced inside as an antidote to the previous belief that it was outside. So the understanding it is inside is is the thorn that is used to remove the thorn. It is outside. But then when we actually investigate what the experience of inside is, what, what, what do we actually, what, like you did spontaneously in this exploration, what, where is this experience taking place? The name we give to the place 
at which experience takes place is here. And experience always takes place here. And if we really make a deep investigation of what is the nature of the, not the place, let's not presume it's a place. Let's just stay very close to experience. Here is an experience. We don't know that it's a place. Let's just call it an experience. What is the nature of the experience we call here? Here is always where I am. That is, here is always where consciousness is. But is it a place in space, given that our only experience of space takes place here? So here cannot be a place in space, because space always happens here. And that's as far as the mind can go. It cannot imagine what the experience of here really is, because the, everything that the mind knows is filtered through its own limitations. So if the mind tries to investigate the nature of the experience called here, it will superimpose its, its own limitations on it, and it will call that place, uh, call the experience here, a place in space. That is just the mind's limited interpretation of the experience here, which is not in space. So your, 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 your intuition, or it's more than intuition, your, your, your experience is, is, is correct. That, that there is no inside or outside to consciousness. The way we say, when we say inside consciousness, we are making a concession to the mind. We are imagining that consciousness is a space, just because the mind believes that everything happens in space. So for one who thinks that the experience takes place out, the, the sound takes place outside consciousness, we say no. As a first step, see that it takes place inside consciousness. Experience takes place neither outside nor inside. There is no outside or inside to the experience called here. It is a dimensionless point, not even a point. But it is not an abstract realm. It is always the ex placeless place at which experience takes place, the only placeless place that anybody has ever experienced. But it did seem to... The creation, as it were, seemed did seem to be part of it, not in the same way that there's differentiated objects, but everything uh, seemed to be there. Absolutely, absolutely. It's possible to, to experience the, the nature of reality in the presence of objects, not just in the absence of objects, because remember, all there is to the presence of objects is a colouring of consciousness. So even during the presence of objects, there is, there is just consciousness. Uh, that we could say objects, or the universe, is, is, a, is the activity of consciousness. So whether there are objects present or not, consciousness is only experiencing consciousness. In, in fact, we talk about consciousness without objects. And that is a... that phrase depends on the on the belief that there that there is consciousness with objects but in fact there is never consciousness plus objects there is always only consciousness coloring itself with its own activity and appearing as the universe or not coloring itself and not appearing so one doesn't have to get rid of objects in order to know the nature of consciousness. It would only be necessary to get rid of objects if objects were something other than consciousness and somehow veiled consciousness's knowledge of itself. All there is at all times and in all experiences is consciousness. Therefore you can, you can take any experience at all, however wonderful or awful or neutral it may be, and go into the heart of that experience. And all that will be found there is consciousness. Shakespeare, and as imagination bodies forth 
the forms of things unknown. A poet's pen turns them into shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, a poet's pen turns them into shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And as God's infinite being bodies forth its own dimensionless presence, a poet's pen, that is the finite mind, turns it into form and gives airy nothing, God's infinite being, a name and a form and makes it appear as a world. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, a poet's pen turns them into shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And as God's infinite being bodies forth its own dimensionless presence, each finite mind turns that presence into objects and forms and, and gives to God's infinite being a temporary name and form. Shakespeare is very much more eloquent than I am. <laughs> <laughs>